Well, um, this morning is going to look a little bit different than our normal Sunday gatherings. Um, so uh, please just uh, bear with us in the process. Our leadership team has been praying and has been wrestling together about what God wants to do uh, in this season of the life of our church. And so this morning, um, each one of the elders is going to come up um, at different points in the service and share what we believe as a leadership team God is inviting us uh, to step into. And so um, as our leadership team over this past season has really been praying, um, there's been a lot of things in discussion that we We've been trying to work through and that we've been wrestling through. Um, and there's one word that really um, was actually shared by Brian at one of our meetings a few months ago um, that really resonated with all of us and is what we believe God is calling our church uh, to step into in the next season. And that word was that God is wanting to take us from a church plant to become a church family. And so this is the, the big vision and the big idea of what we believe God's wanting to do, to move out of church planting mode and into church family mode. Um, if you haven't been here that long and you don't really know the history of the story, it was six years ago that I was working at the church in Eugene. I had felt a calling on my life for a long time to church plant, but specifically six years ago, uh, God placed on my heart a vision to move to Ashland uh, to start a brand new church. And so in July, of 2017, almost exactly six years ago. I moved down here with, uh, with my wife, Lisa, and with a team of five people from Eugene, from the church that I was working at there, uh, to, to, to come together to, in Ashland and to just plant the church and believe that God wanted to do something. And so um, our first gathering in the summer, six years ago, we met in Lithia Park, and it was kind of crazy. I had this meeting in Lithia Park um, with this um, new age dude this week. And it was like really crazy, like sitting on this like, you know, rainbow blanket with like an octopus on it. And I realized the place I was sitting was exactly like where our first church meeting was. I was like, this is kind of weird to see, you know, what God's doing now. But our first gathering at Lithia Park, um, it was interesting. One of my buddies, James was there. We we're sitting under this big tree and there was this stuff written on this tree. There's a sign about it. Um, long story short, this tree, a certain type of oak, it said most oaks grow really slow, but this oak is, uh, is, is a type of oak tree that grows really fast. And my buddy James, um, at that first meeting ever, uh, he said he believed God was giving him a prophetic word for what God was wanting to do in the church plant, in the life of the story. He said, just as this tree that we just so happen to be under grows really fast, he said, I believe that God is wanting to um, grow this church at a supernatural rate. And so um, over the course of the next four months, um, the story went from five people moving down from Eugene to 25 people meeting in a park to 150 people in the Ashland Community Center. And then four months later is when we were given this building um, that we're currently in by the Christian Church of Ashland and began to see more and more people coming and um, just excited to see what God was doing here in the community. And seeing that word four months ago that James had shared really come into life, it was, it was actually shocking. It was like, wow, like God's actually on the move here. And so um, as, as a church planter, having that vision to come and start a church in Ashland, um, it was exciting to see all this. It was exciting to see God moving in such a powerful way. It was exciting to see people coming to Jesus. It was exciting getting to baptize people. It was exciting to see the church growing and obviously being given this building was a huge blessing. Um, but at the same time that all that was happening, um, as the church was growing so quick, um, you can't really plan for that. And over time, um, I, I began to feel exhausted. I began to feel burnt out because the weight of the ministry, you know, managing five people in a park, that's pretty easy. But then as it grows so quickly, I began to feel burnt out. I began to feel um, a little bit exhausted. I began to grow tired, feeling like the weight of the ministry and the weight of the church was resting solely upon my shoulders. More and more tasks came up, more and more planning, more and more preparation, more and more people to meet with. And I just felt like I couldn't do this all by myself. So um, over the course of the next few years, if you guys have been here long enough, you probably remember these stages. Um, we, were, we were blessed to be able to bring on some, some key hires and to have some amazing people come and join the team to help relieve some of the burden and to help carry some of the load. And over the past few years as well, we have raised up a local team of elders to help lead the church as well. Uh, but the truth is this. Uh, that while God has blessed our church uh, with an amazing team of leaders, staff, and elders, um, in, in the transition of all of that, in the transition of going from doing everything by myself and being able to do anything that I wanted and having complete control of the vision and the direction of the church, as I began to grow the leadership team, uh, it, it became very difficult for me to 
became difficult to let go of that control. And it became difficult to allow other people to speak into the vision and the direction of the church. And I, I didn't expect that. I, I didn't see that coming, but that was just the reality. The truth is, as, as a church planter, I felt that the church that I was starting was a direct reflection of me. And so the truth is, I, I tried to build the church, I tried to grow the church around my own gifting and around my own vision. And in doing so, over time, I began to realize I was putting limits on what God was wanting to do. By just making it about me and my vision and my gifts and what I want the church to be and how I want it to go, I was limiting God. These have been conversations that we've been having uh, amongst our leaders um, for probably uh, at least the past year, but it wasn't until about a month ago that, that the Lord really started revealing this to me at, at, to a point where I, I was able to hear it and where I was able to receive it. And it was a month ago I was reading in 2 Samuel chapter 12 where I had you turn this morning. And as I was reading this passage, some of you guys have had these experiences before. It was like God was speaking so clearly. You might have that at church sometimes. You're like, does the pastor know? Does someone tell him what I'm doing or what I'm going through, right? That's what the word of God does. So I was just there, uh, opened up to 2 Samuel chapter 12. I was just reading in my devotions and, begot, and God began to expose my heart he began to bring me to a place of humility, to a place of repentance. And for the first time in a long time, in the midst of the exhaustion um, and everything that I was experiencing, uh, I felt a state of peace because I, I was hearing clearly God expose the areas where I needed to grow in my life. So if you don't know 2 Samuel 12, to kind of set up the context briefly, um, Right before this, David had just uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba. Um, he was up on his roof, looking down, beautiful woman taking a bath. He brought her over into um, his castle, if you would, committed adultery with her. And then in trying to cover up his sin, you guys might know the story, Bathsheba was married to a man, Uriah, who was in David's army. David said, hey, have Uriah go out to the front of the battlefield, pull everybody else back. And essentially, David had Uriah murdered in cold blood on the battlefield to try to cover up his adultery. And so uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12 is a direct following of that. And in 2 Samuel 12, God uh, sends a man by the name of Nathan, who was a prophet of God, to come and expose David's sin. And as David just got Bathsheba pregnant, ultimately, uh, long story short, Nathan tells this story about a man who had no sheep and a man who had a lot, and the man who had a lot of sheep went and took the one sheep from the man who was poor, and he, he, he killed that sheep to have a feast. And then David's like, that's messed up. I can't believe someone's doing that in my kingdom. Whoever that person is should be killed and should be put to death. And then David says, that person is you. You are the rich man, you are the king, you have a million concubines if you want, and, and you took this one man's wife and you committed adultery with her. And Nathan announced that because of David's sin of adultery, he said that this child, which was a child of the flesh, a child that David created in his own strength because of his own will, Nathan said that this child was going to die. So that is the setup and the context for what I wanna share with you guys this morning. If you wanna look down where the story picks up in verse 15, it says this. 2 Samuel 12, verse 15. Then Nathan went to his house and the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David and he became sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child and fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So David, at this season, um, he's at rock of rock bottoms. Uh, he's completely broken. He knows that he's committed adultery. Um, the, the prophet Nathan said that your, your son's now gonna die because of this. And in David's brokenness, it says that he fasted and he laid on the ground all night. As I was reading this passage and just meditating on it and praying about it, um, the first thing that God was showing me 
uh, and, and exposing in me as I was reading the story of David exposing the sin uh, or of Nathan exposing the sin of David, God was showing me that like David, um, I had tried to turn the church and make the church into my own child, if you would. Some pastors, and I, and I hate it when they say this, it's kind of cringy, but they say like the church is like your baby. And I get what they're saying, but the, the reality is, the, and the truth is that that's what I had felt that I had done with the church. The, the church in a way became my child. Um, it became something that, that I wanted to make into the child and into the church that I wanted to be. And the truth is over the past five years, when, when you plant the church, just as if when you start any sort of business or there's anything you have ownership over, you care deeply about all the small details. And so in, in, in the past five years of the church, um, again, I, I have cared about every single aspect of the church and, and worked hard to the best of my ability to create the type of culture and the type of church that I would want to be a part of and that I would want to pastor. But the downside of that is that in, in, in caring so much about all the meticulous small things, the downside is, uh, again, I, 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 made the ch I made the church what I wanted the church to be, and maybe not so much necessarily what God wanted the church to be. I, I made the church about me and about uh, my vision and my direction and, again, my gifts and not saying, God, what do you want to do? And as a result, even though over the past five years the, the, the church has grown and we're, we're blessed with um, the, the people that we've been able to invest in and disciple and the people that have gotten saved, but even though the church was, was growing and it feels like things were going well, um, because there were things in my life that I was not trusting God with, but I was doing in my own strength, over time, I just became even more and more exhausted. While it may have looked like, whoa, a successful church, everything's great, everything's healthy, that was not the case in, in my heart. There was a lot of um, exhaustion and there was a lot of um, deep brokenness in my spirit, even in the midst of a healthy and thriving church. And so like David, um, he says he, he, he laid all night on the ground. I was reading this passage a month ago and I was just, I was just there alone and just crying out to the Lord saying, God, what am I supposed to do? Like David creating his own child, I've done that in the church, what, what am I supposed to do? And then this, the passage continues, look at this in verse 17 and 18, it says this. It says, and the elders of the house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, the child is dead? We, uh, he may do himself some harm. So David's laying on the ground. He's completely broken over his sin, over creating a child in his own flesh rather than with his spouse taking another spouse. And as David lays there on the ground, it's really interesting. It says that the elders came and stood beside him and they came to raise him up, to support him, to encourage him. But it says, but the, the, he would not. He would not allow them to, to, to lift him up. He would not allow them to pick him up. And it says that the, specifically as well, they said, we spoke to him and he didn't listen to us. So David did not listen to the elders. David did not allow the, the elders to pick him up and to carry him in the midst of this deep season of brokenness in his life. And again, as I was reading this, um, I was so humbled. As I was reading this, I was just like, wow, this is, it, it is amazing how clearly God can, can speak through his word. And it is, it is a testimony of the power of God's word because like David, God had given me an amazing team of elders and leaders and people who were willing to help support me, who were willing to help carry the load of the ministry. But the truth is I was the one who was unwilling. Like David, here they are to support you. Here they are to raise you up. And he wouldn't let them. And God was very clearly saying, that's you, Zav. This is what you've been doing. And my unwillingness, it was directly connected to what I already shared. It was directly connected to how, uh, to, to, to how I tried to make the church into my thing, how I wanted to see my vision come to fruition, how I wanted it to be a space where I could use my gifts. And, and, and that was the main piece as to why I was unwilling to allow help and to allow support and to allow other people to speak into my life is because the truth is I was operating out of fear. I was afraid of letting the elders speak into the vision and speak into the direction of the church because of fear that it would compromise the type of church that I wanted the story to be. 
it, 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 was a, it was a dangerous way of operating. It, it was a dangerous way of doing things. It, it, it was pure fear, pure power, purely trying to hold on to the control that, that I had when there was no accountability at the beginning and, and when I could do anything that I wanted. And so as a church planter, my, my tendency was to just do everything by myself because again, I was... Um, I was very particular about how I wanted things to be done. I wanted everything to be perfect because again, I thought that the church was a reflection of me. But again, in my failure to trust God's desire to use other people to advance the mission and to advance the vision, um, the, the, the church being built only on my gifts, there was a lot of holes that there was a lot of weaknesses. While I do have a huge heart for the lost and um, f- feel a heart for evangelism to go after the lost, the reality is um, the, the church had a very low discipleship culture. There, there was a lack of discipleship. There has been a lack of discipleship. There's been a lack of a sense of family because my, my vision, if you would, is just, just continue going after the lost, but not actually shepherding the people that were here not actually seeing how we could disciple and invest in the church family because I was always looking out there. I was always looking at who's not here rather than who is here. And so again, God began to just expose in me that, uh, that because of this, uh, we've been missing out on a deep sense of family, which is essentially what a church is supposed to be. That God created the church to be a family, that God created the church to be a body where every person in the family and where every person in the body shoulders the load, where every person has a different role, where every person has different responsibilities. And God has been showing me through this season that uh, my leadership at the story has to change in order for the story to become a church family. I have to let go of the control. I have to let go of, of my vision and what I want the church to be and to say, God, what do you want the church to be? So this is what God was exposing and bringing up in my heart. The story continues in verse 19 and 20, and it says this. It says, but when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house. And when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. So at at this point in the story, it's now made known to David, hey, as the prophet Nathan spoke, the child that you made in your own strength, the child that you made because of your flesh, that that child had now died. And after the child died, it's very important to note what David does here. It says, and David anointed himself and he changed his clothes and he went into the house of the Lord to worship. Again, I I just, as I was reading this a month ago, I couldn't believe just how clearly the, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. And God was showing me that the child or the church, if you would, that I had been building in my own flesh and that I had been building in my own strength, it has to die in order for the church to become the church that Jesus wants it to be. I had to let go of my vision. I had to let go of the church being my child. I had to let go of the church being a space for my gifts. And what I realized is that if, if I continued to just hold on to my vision for my church and continue to lead out of my own strength, the natural outcome is that either the church would die or I would eventually burn out uh, because I was, I, was, I was leading by myself. I wasn't allowing other people to help me. So the natural outcome is, is, is we have to willingly just, I had to willingly give it up and say, God, I'm, I'm just giving it to you. I, I, I wanna offer it to you as a sacrifice. I have to offer it to God or in time, we were not heading down a, um, a healthy path and the church would either die or I would either burn out. And so in, in that moment, as, as the, the people said to David, hey, it's, it's dead, the, the child is dead. In that moment on my couch a month ago, um, I, I surrendered, and it's interesting, John was sharing up here about surrender. Just holding your hands open. Surrendering what you want. Surrendering what you think is best. And as we surrender, our hands are open and we receive what God wants. So on my couch that night, I surrendered to what I've known God has been calling me to for a long time. 
I repented before the Lord. I surrendered the perceived control that I had been holding on to. And I just said, God, something has to change or the church is gonna die or, or I'm gonna burn out. Uh, I wanna surrender completely. I want to hold open hands. I want a soft heart. I want you to change my heart. I want you to give vision and direction for what type of church you want us to be. And as I let go of control before the Lord, like David, we, we see that as, as David did this, he realized, man, the child is dead. I said, God, I'm, I'm giving this child over to you. I'm giving this church over to you. I'm surrendering it. I don't want it to be my church. I don't want it to be about my vision. I want to surrender it to you. And when David did this and realized, hey, the, the, the old has to die, it says that again, that David washed himself and he anointed himself and he changed his clothes and he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. As I was reading that, it was, it was just like water to my soul. I was saying, wow. This is what I need to just go into the house of the Lord and just worship. Not to go and use my gifts. Not to go and lead everybody and be the front person necessarily. Not to go and bring my vision, but to just go into the house of the Lord and worship. David changed his clothes, anointed himself, and he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. And this is exactly as I was reading that, I was like, man, this is what I need to do. I gotta I got I got change my clothes. I gotta change my ways. I gotta allow God's spirit to bring a fresh anointing for a new season of ministry. And honestly, I, I just need to go into the house of the Lord and, and worship. Not lead people in worship, but be led into worship, giving my heart back to the Lord. And so, as I let go of control and realize that this is what I need, um, what, what I realize is, is, is the process of making the shift of church planter, doing everything by myself, having control over everything to actually leading together as a team and letting go of control, which is what I believe needs to happen. Um, I was reflecting on this passage and I shared all of this with the elders about a month ago. And I said, man, th this is what I need truly. What I need is just a season to just go into the house of the Lord and worship. That's what I need. And so in light of these shifts that needed to be made, I, I requested of the elders to take a teaching sabbatical for the summer season in order to be able to just come here into the house of the Lord and worship without the stress without the pressure of ministry or having to perform or being the person leading everything or having control over everything in the gathering. I said, I need to just come to the house of the Lord and worship um, and, ju and just allow God to put new clothes on me, if you would, to allow God to fill me with a new anointing to be able to lead in a season together in the future as a team, to let go of control and believe that God is in control. And so I requested this and... The elders saw the benefit of this and the elders of the story have graciously decided to give me the next three months to step back from teaching. I'm still gonna be here most Sundays except for a vacation or two I have planned, uh, but I will still be here. I'll still be working um, full time at the story and my shift, uh, uh, there's gonna be a shift in my role over the summer as teaching responsibility um, is gonna be relieved. Uh, there's gonna be a focus for this next season of, uh, in, in my ministry to help develop and equip future leaders who can help carry the work of the ministry forward because again, my tendency as a church planter is just to do everything. It, it, it just, I want it to be perfect. I want to, and, and I just do everything. And what we've realized and what the elders have realized is that this isn't healthy. It's not healthy for me to do everything. Our role as pastors is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And I have failed at that. I've not equipped leaders. I've not equipped the body. I've not equipped people. I've tried to do it all by myself. And as a result, it's brought me to this place of just feeling burned out. And so, I am excited in this summer season. I'm grateful to be able to have this season. I'm excited to step back from teaching. I'm excited to begin to pray and, and dream with God and with the elders and with our team and strategize what does it look like to, to cultivate a healthy family where each person is carrying their load. 
where, where it's not just the staff and not just the elders, but where each person has a place to use their gifts and to serve. And so I'm excited for this coming season to help equip and develop and raise up leaders in our church to advance the mission of Jesus in the city of Ashland. What I wanna close with for my portion is this, verse 26 through 28. It says this, now Joab fought against Rabbah of the Ammonites and he took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah. Moreover, I have taken the city of waters. Now look at verse 28. It says, now then, gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called by my name. Wow. Brian Pinnell this morning texted our elder group and he said, uh, I feel like, again, just the, the word that God is wanting for our church family is to, to just be gathered together. And he had no idea. I was just reading this this morning in my office. And I was like, I, I read his text literally as I'm reading this. He's like, we're, we're called to gather together as a family. And I was like, wow. He said, now gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city, lest I take it and it be called by my name. And again, just the, the Lord, and this was just this morning, the Lord was speaking this. I was like, wow, this, this is exactly what God is wanting us to do in this season of our church. He's calling us to gather together. He's calling us to gather the people together because I don't want this city and I don't want the church to be after my name. And, and that, that, that's what it has been. And, and that's what I have been doing. Building up a church in, in my own name, building up a church on my own strengths. And I don't want that for the future of the story. I, I want it to be a place where we gather together and where we are on mission together to encamp against the city, to take the city and to see the kingdom of God advanced here in the city of Ashland. And so in this season, I believe God is calling our church family to gather together. And I am gonna be focusing again on equipping and empowering the church body to be on mission, to see God's kingdom advance in Ashland and in the Rogue Valley um, and, and this is what I believe God is wanting to do in our church in this coming season. So um, with, with, with that being said, I'm gonna invite at this time Aaron up, who's one of the elders here. And Aaron is gonna share a little bit more about um, some, some changes that we're gonna be making in this season. And uh, so would you guys just please welcome Aaron to the stage. Is it on? Yeah. So, so you guys might be doing the math already, thinking like, oh man, there's four of you that are gonna talk, half an hour. So they gave me 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes, and I'm gonna to stick to that this morning. So a little Bible trivia. For those of you that don't know, the shortest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 117. Um, Psalm 133 that we're gonna read this morning is actually the fourth shortest. So hey, I, I kind of tricked my wife on the way drive here. She's like, what are you gonna read? I said, the Psalm 133, the whole thing? Yeah, the whole thing. And then she looked it up, she's like, oh geez, it's only three verses. <laughs> It got me. So let's read. It says in Psalm 133, a song of degrees of David. Behold, how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell in unity. <clears throat> it is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment, as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. And I've, you guys might have heard this psalm before. And I always have pictured this when I, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but when I've pictured this, this psalm, um, for whatever reason, I, I don't really have pictures of a lot of Bible verses, but I picture this guy that has a beard. And, you know, back in the day, mine wasn't quite as gray. But a gray beard, now mine's kind of getting a little gray. In a valley, the sun's coming up, and the oil is running down his beard and he's just enjoying life. And that's the picture, I think, of when I hear the brothers dwelling together in unity. Now, some of you that know me, I have four boys. Those of you that have multiple boys, like it when they get along. <laughs> and when, when they are kind to each other. You know, they just do stuff and they're like, hey, would you like to go with me to do this? And you're like, wow, you asked. And I didn't even ask you to take him along. It's, it just brings joy to your heart when your kids are kind and loving and thoughtful to each other. And when you don't have to ask them to do it. You know, when you ask them to do it and they're kind of like, yeah, I guess I'll do that. 
And you know that they don't really want to, but they are going to because you're the dad and you've asked them to do it. And this morning as we were, you know, splitting these things up and this morning, I, I was, this verse came to mind and it's really about family. And even as Zav shared that we've been kind of thinking this, that we want to go from growth, meaning growth in numerical to growth in your sinking your roots deeper. Like people are actually growing in who God is and growing in the relationship with Jesus as opposed to just coming and consuming. You know, it's kind of been a theme for a while. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there has been a shift and we want people to go deeper. And we know that that happens when we realize we're part of a family. Family's messy, you know? I don't know about, you know, family reunion. You, you know, you, you get together and you're like, oh, you know, Uncle George comes and he's kind of weird and Aunt Mary and, you know, and, and, and or you may be the weird one, I don't know. <laughs> but you realize family is messy. Even this morning, like, Coy's like, oh, hey, I forgot every, go do, that. let me do another song. And if you know, if you're family, it's totally cool. But if it's a performance, you're like, oh man, he screwed up. But he didn't. It just is the way it is. And we want to make that shift to becoming more of a family. We understand we're here to grow together, okay? So with that in mind, this is probably not going to be very shocking to you guys, or you guys are probably like, okay, no big deal. The next service might, you know, not love this as much. But we've been talking and talking and talking about this for months. But we're going to go to one service for the summer, okay? One service meaning, yeah, thank you. Some of you are like, yes. Okay, those of you that are, nah, no, nope, talk to Brian. Um, <clears throat> just joking. Um, but one service, I, I lobbied for 10 o'clock because I live in Grants Pass. And I, I, the old days, those of you that have, haven't been here for a long time, but in the old days, it was one service at 10. It was perfect. You get sleep in a little bit, you get here. But the other three guys are like, no, we can't. Okay, so at 9.30, okay, so we're going to go to 9.30. And you might say, well, when are we going to do this? We're going to do this next Sunday. Okay, so those of you that are like, oh man, I know my friend is, let them know. Next Sunday, it's going to be 9.30, okay? And a couple reasons why we're going to go to one service. One, we're going to be rotating the teaching, okay? So I'm going to do some, Rousseau's going to do some, Brian and a couple other people. And so you're going to see a different person. So if you don't like the person that you, just wait, you'll get someone next week, okay? <laughs> you know, that, and that's what family's all about. It's like, yeah, it's okay. It's good. And it's a time you get to practice a little bit too, okay? So we'll give people grace. But we're going to be rotating that. And so a lot of us, Sunday is our day off, okay? And so we didn't really want to do two services. That's, a, you know, it's a lot for someone that's, as, you know, having their job and whatnot. So that was one reason. The other reason is, and it looks a little bit more full today, but we've been counting for a, a few months to see is, you know, are there seats available at the second service? And sometimes it's a little bit much, sometimes it's not. And we felt that during the summer months, people take vacations, you know, college kids go away for a while and whatnot, and that we'd have a room to do this. This is why. Um, we're gonna have a prayer practice from 8.30 to 9.20-ish um, that you guys can come and be a part of. Um, so it's not just like, hey, we're praying at 8.30 before the kids, you know, run off the class and whatnot. So if you want to become a part of what's going on with the prayer, um, because we want to kind of go deeper with prayer, and Rousseau's going to talk about that next. Is he here, too? Is he back here? Where is, is he with the kids? Because he's next. <laughs> I just want to make sure. Was it? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. That'd be awesome. Because he is next. And I'm, yeah. Anyway, back to this. So. Um, I totally tra lost my train of thought now. That's good. Um, but we're going to be going to, to one service at 9.30 next week, okay? So be prepared for that. The prayer practice, that's what I was talking about. Prayer practice from 8.30 to 9.20-ish, and that's going to be kind of changing from week to week. And we just invite you to come and be a part of that as well. Um, if you might be sitting there going, well, what happens if all these people come and what will we do? And it will, will change. It's, it's pretty easy, you know, it's like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put, set some chairs up downstairs, well, what if that fills up, then we'll go back to two services in, um, if that's what it calls for. But at this season right now, we're just going to be like, hey, can you like squeeze in, there's extra chairs here, and, and we'll just fit people in as we, um, as we see fit. Is he coming? Okay, so what he was going to talk about was this, I'll just do a little introduction to so the next part, so I've used my five minutes to ten minutes. Um, <clears throat> What we're going to be doing for the summer is we're going to be doing a series on prayer, okay? And not just talking about prayer. We're going to be 
teaching, sharing about prayer, but then also doing prayer practices. Because what we find is this. If it's just up here and we're just talking and talking about stuff and we're not actually doing the stuff, it doesn't always sink in. And I know I said this and I got a little bit of complaints one time when I talked, that when you go out the door, there's like this giant eraser, you know, and they have the, the formational challenge. I'm challenged by the formational challenge. Not, not challenged as in like, I want to do it, but I'm challenged as, as I go out the door and it's just erased out of my head. It's like, I come back the next week and they go like, the formational challenge, I'm like, ah, dang, I didn't even do the last week's. It just tends to go out of my head. So we're going to cement these things by actually practicing them here before you actually go out. Rousseau, here he is. He finds here. Oh, you won't be applauding once you hear the bad news I have to bring. (laughs) No, only kidding. Uh, Good morning, guys. As you heard, it's going to be a full summer. A lot going on. Um, I really sense the Lord doing a a deepening work in our church this summer. Um, And before I share about the series we're going to be doing, uh, I just want to say, like, uh, very proud of you, Zav. I know it takes a lot of trust in the Lord to step out of stuff that you're always doing. Um, It'd probably be easier for you to teach a 20-week series on rest than to actually (laughs) rest. Um, It also takes a lot of trust in others. So I just want to say I'm proud of you. And um, just as a church, I have never sensed the Lord um, in my 15 years of discipleship doing the work that he's doing, not just here, but in the world uh, from my mentor over in Australia. Uh, He's an Anglican. They're doing this deep prayer work. Um, The intentional leadership conference we went to last year was the same thing. It was such a prayer emphasis, different stories from within the church that you guys are going to be hearing over the next week. Um, It seems like the Lord is really doing a work of gathering his people and calling them to pray. And, uh, And that's really how any and every work of God ever takes place in the history of the world. You'll never read of God doing something great great or big without first teaching his, his people to pray. Because if it doesn't come from prayer, then people just think, oh, we planned that, we promoted that, we strategized, and it was awesome and successful. But when it's based in prayer, uh, God loves to move. So I, for one, think that's, that, that God's on the move doing something big, but it begins with prayer. Um, you guys probably know and have experienced, sorry, I'm out of breath, came from teaching. <laughs> kids ministry. Uh, You guys know there's lots of uh, difficulties, hindrances, and uh, and problems with prayer, and we're going to be addressing those. Um, But more than anything, this is not going to be a series uh, that heaps up shame and guilt on anyone for their lackluster prayer life. In fact, this is actually going to be a series that that shows that from Jesus's teachings, prayer was never meant to be a religious duty or a strict discipline that we feel guilty for not doing. Jesus sought prayer as an invitation to step into and realize and recognize our identity as sons and daughters of the Father who are then partnering with Jesus the Son in accomplishing his mission in this world by the power of his Holy Spirit. It's totally Trinitarian, which is why this prayer series is gonna be called uh, You Are Here. And what that means is um, in prayer, uh, it's, it's less about how you do it and when you do it and all the duties and disciplines. It's about remembering that in prayer, you are right in the blazing center of God's heart, that the Father loves you, the Son has redeemed you, the Spirit indwells you, and that is what's at the heart of prayer. People never get riled up about prayer when it's just like, hey, let's do more of this duty and discipline. But when, like Jesus, we find delight in the Father's presence and are moved by the Spirit to participate in this divine conversation that's been happening from all eternity, that really changes prayer and the heart of prayer. So you are here following Jesus into the joy of prayer, um, not religious duties and let's do more of this. Um, so that's, that's what we're gonna be about. Uh, as you guys know, Jesus, when he came into the temple, he didn't say, Uh, my father's house shall be a house of worship or a house of preaching or a house of prophecy or a house of coffee and muffins, as good as all those things are. He said, my father's house shall be a house of prayer. And that's what we sense God is doing in this church family is calling us to be a place where prayer is at the center and is the driving force of everything that we do. So looking forward to um, diving into that starting next weekend. And uh, this will be a stretching series. Um, It'll push many of us outside of our comfort zones. But in my experience, and probably in yours, no spiritual growth ever takes place inside your comfort zone. 
If you read the book of Acts, it's, it's always outside of our comfort zone, outside of the norm, outside of the routine that God deepens us and stretches us and matures us. So get ready to be stretched. And as just a, a final uh, pastoral encouragement, I would just encourage you to stay connected through the summer. It's easy uh, in summertime to just become lackluster or to let apathy and sloth creep in. But uh, I, wanna, I wanna encourage you to remain connected and, and serving and plugged in. And if you're not serving, if you're like, nobody would even notice if I wasn't at church today, that's a problem. Uh, you know, we wanna get you connected, fill out a connect card. There's lots of opportunities to serve and go deeper and grow deeper together. As you guys know, the primary metaphor in the Bible for the church is the body. So if a bunch of the body members are missing, um, then, then we have a problem. So stay connected. I'm not saying don't go on vacation, but uh, definitely come and be connected and serve and, and plug into what the Lord is doing here. Um, and, and I'm gonna invite Penelope up now to share a few things that we're gonna be doing for the prayer practices. As I do, uh, just if you guys have any needs this summer, like as the family pastor, I'm here for that. That's literally what I'm here for. So please hit me up. Thanks, Penelope. Thank you. Thank you. This is, this, my part's really quick and easy, and Aaron kind of just gave you a, a hint of how, what this series is gonna be. So I just wanna tell you, a little bit more about the prayer series, and hopefully it'll get you not just nervous, but excited as well. Um, because one of the things we realize is we don't pray together enough as a church. We just don't. We have, we, in a, especially in the American church, in the evangelical church, we've built these patterns, and this is what you do, and you do these things in this order. So if you think about it, on any given Sunday, um, you might have a prayer at the call to worship, maybe, right? Um, Maybe during the sermon one time, maybe pray over the person that shared their story. Uh, and that's sometimes the extent of what we do as praying together as the body of Christ. And, and God calls us to, to do that. You read the scripture, you know, he's, he calls us to pray together. Um, and we believe that part of the reason for this series is because the church is not merely meant to be a roster of individuals who pray privately but we are a family who pray together. And sometimes we neglect that practice. And we know that we have. And we want to, to bring that back to the forefront of, of who we are. Um, and another thing is sometimes we have too narrow a view of what prayer is. You know, if, if, if you were to ask some people, myself included, what does it mean to pray? Well, it's bow your head, ask for things you want and need, say some nice things about God so you don't feel too selfish, and then say amen. You know? <laughs> But that is just not the only thing prayer is. Sometimes prayer doesn't even involve words. Sometimes prayer is just listening. Sometimes prayer is privately. Sometimes it's corporate. Sometimes prayer involves standing. Sometimes prayer involves sitting. Sometimes it involves kneeling. Sometimes it's walking. Prayer is so much bigger than we've defined it, and we put it in these little prayer boxes. Um, and, and so we want to be introducing in this series not just concepts, like we've said, but practices. And so um, this is the part where you can say amen. Um, our sermons are going to be shorter this summer. <laughs> Uh, because we want to build into every Sunday time to not just talk about prayer, but then together at the end of each week to pray those, to pray the prayers that we're talking about. And, and I thought it was so beautiful how, how John didn't know that this morning. But like, here's a great example. One of the weeks we'll probably be talking about the importance of posture during prayer and being open or have your hands lifted or what, what do your hands mean? What do they signify? We'll be doing things of that nature. Um, we'll be encouraging us to try it as a church. We'll be praying some prayers where we, they're scripted, and these are words we're going to pray together. Some prayers where it's, you're invited, if you feel comfortable, no one's forced to do any of these. If you feel comfortable, you're invited to get with other people and to pray about certain things. And, and, and like Aaron was saying, the idea behind that is we, we, we listen to God's word about it, then we'll practice it a little bit, that Sunday, and then the next Sunday, if you want to come at 8.30, we will do it again together. And so that we're actually like making this a pattern and we're repeating these things. Um, because here's, here's what we think. I think we all learned a saying um, when we were young that is false. And I don't want to shatter this for you, but I think it's false. We learned practice makes perfect, right? That's not true. 
Practice makes progress. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes progress. And as a church, we want to progress in our spiritual discipline of praying to the Lord and how we pray together because we believe prayer is a ever-evolving relationship with God. There isn't one way to do it. We're not gonna reach the pinnacle and yes, we nailed it. But it's ever-evolving. It's always changing. So it may feel awkward at first, some of the things. Um, but we also believe that sometimes, no, most of the time, it takes awkwardness to break through to new ways of drawing closer to God. So we're excited about this. We hope that you're excited about this. Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite um, theologians, he says this, Believe me, if a church does not pray, it is a dead church. Instead of putting united prayer last, put it first. Everything will hinge upon the power of prayer in the church family. We believe in this. We'll be putting that into practice this summer and we're going to start right now. And so we want to take about five minutes as a church today as a prayer practice. Um, we want to invite you to pray over the things that we have shared this morning. We want to invite you to pray for Zav. Pray a prayer of thanks for the work that he has done. Because he did focus a lot on the things that he called his mistakes or his sins. But it would be uh, shameful to not also lift up the things that he has done at this church. And so pray for Zav, a prayer of thanks and a prayer that God will continue to grow him um, where God is calling us. Pray for the, the elders and the leaders that, that we listen when God calls us to prayer practice and to those things. Pray for our summer and, and coming together in one series and pray for us as a church as we continue to grow who we believe God wants us to be. So you're invited during this four or five minutes. Um, before we close, you're invited to pray with others. Pray by yourself. You're invited to kneel. You're invited, however you want to pray to God, we're inviting you to pray today that God's blessing be upon us this summer as we as a church enter to a new season. Thank you for listening this morning. 